Last Bite Productions presents the New Way podcast. The New Way contains adult content, but since this is one of our special edition short episodes, we don't have time to record one of our comedic adult content warning masterpieces. I mean, we could have in about the same amount of time it took to tell you we wouldn't, but we didn't. So there. Listener discretion is advised. That was perfect. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Wood, do you know anything about the art of film production? Well, I like to think so. That cardboard headstone tipped over. The, this graveyard is obviously phony. Nobody will ever notice that. Filmmaking is not about the tiny details. It's about the big picture. The big picture? Yes. Then how about when the policeman arrived in daylight, but now it's suddenly night? Are you people insane? I'm the director! Everybody wants to be Help teach me about this. What is it? A new way. Hello and welcome to a special edition of the New Way Podcast where we break down pop culture so you don't have to. This is one of our shorter, more bite-sized episodes and features a spotlight on locations, actors, actresses, directors, writers, and more. Less preamble, more amble. Not uh, all simultaneously, though. Not sometimes. Sometimes it's an actor, director, writer, director. You know, when we get to the the Ben Affleck episode, we're gonna have our hands full of just a masterclass in everything that a person can do. Um, He's the bomb in Phantoms, yeah. This is true. Nice. Um, we're also, of course, still in the midst of the coronavirus, so we are uh, we are recording from separate locations. I have Ben over. Uh, do we really do we really need to say that anymore? Sort of like when you get in a the plane, they said, uh, "Remember smoking? Uh, no smoking on the plane." Yeah, you never know. It's we're, we're, ba- we're backlogging so many episodes as this well. This is true. Like, we some could of be these out could of air this. in like August, and we're That's just wish, like wishful yeah. thinking. This is all we're we're just reminding people why we are not together <laughs> when we should be together. Um, but I've got Ben over. Cruel on, fate. Cruel, cruel fate. Ben over on my one Zoom window. How's it going, yep. Benny? And I got, I'm doing good. I'm six point one miles away from you. There we go. And I got Nick on the other, coming from Los Angeles. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, it's great it's to see not s- me panting. Penny the Golden Retriever just <laughs> ran into my room. But Nick was really excited about this episode. <laughs> I um, am, but that was not me. This is um, a really, this is an exciting episode for me. Um, and we're, in fact, those of you that don't know, we do record a lot of these ones back to back, the short episodes. I really like the ones we're doing today, even though they're going to air who knows when. Um, but our first one is on director Christopher Nolan, who is one of my favorite. Um, we're really one of the very few people that can direct blockbusters and kind of arty films and and really make stuff that makes you think. And it doesn't always land, but it is always extremely original and personal and interesting. And I think that's um, to take big swings like that and to be able to make he's made 10 essentially major films in his career. I mean, one nine and one kind of shorter one, but the, his big releases. And they are huge movies. They are they make a lot at the box office, and they are varying degrees of independent to not independent. Um, just a little bit on Christopher Nolan. Um, you things that he uses in his films. He definitely likes to talk and study identity and time. Those seem to come up over and over again in almost every one of his films. Um, he has a brother named Jonathan who's also no slouch in the writing department. He's actually helped him write several of his movies, The Prestige, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, and Memento is actually based on, on Jonathan his... Nolan's short story. Short story, um, yeah. Which is kind of cool. Nolan has written or co-written nine of his ten releases. Insomnia is the only movie that he did not contribute to the screenplay, which is also kind of amazing. Um, he's a huge film geek. He, uh, he grew up kind of um, idolizing Ridley Scott and... Uh, space 2001 a space odyssey star wars well, there's your first problem yeah <laughs> yeah I say that makes a lot of all right. sense for all right ben. strap in everybody yeah we're gonna get to <laughs> ben's hot takes on nolan soon um, i'm actually just loving twisting the knife a little bit a little <laughs> bit because i i um obviously if you had to talk about who the most some of the most when it comes to clout who the most powerful director is right now probably in the world outside of your say steven spielberg uh, you know, type, uh, it has to be uh, Chris Nolan. There's just no question. 
All right. I was, I was, I'm, I'm assuming Ben has also prepared his full list of 50 directors better than Christopher Nolan, and will also link to the BuzzFeed uh, <laughs> that he has his delay is presented of that. But yeah, Nolan is. He, uh, there were things that, when I was kind of reading up on him, I didn't know he was a big film geek as a kid, like into like cheesy stuff like Star Wars. He would shoot. Uh, Star Wars like riffs in in stop animation on his Super 8 they called called it Space Wars and his uncle actually worked for NASA and his he sent him like rocket footage and Nolan would tape that or video that with the Super 8 and splice it into his films as like a special effects scene which is kind of amazing um he had a real tough time outside of film school he Tried he would worked as a script reader, a camera operator, and then directed a bunch of corporate videos. He wasn't really poor guy. Was, poor guy <laughs> wasn't hitting mm-hmm. very big. But he also was interesting. He goes to um, University College London, which has a, apparently like had a really amazing film department, including the, like some special edit bay and some things. I don't things I'm a little bit beyond my a, a my special knowledge. edit bay. Is it like a vibrating? No, chair? it was like some like revolutionary like edit bear. It was like a, like for the time. This is you know seventy. Or, I'm you sorry, edit, edit bear. Is there edit, edit bay, bear there? Do, edit doing bay. all the work for them. Oh. The edit bay, not the edit bears. Yeah, it's bear. like he, he's like they had an avid machine. <laughs> yeah. where other people were still editing on flatbed. Yeah, they like they had something <laughs> special. And, hey, but, boo boo! Check out these transitions. <laughs> but he doesn't. He doesn't major in film. He majors in uh, English lit because he said he wanted to get a different perspective on what he thought he might be using in in filming. It was really. It's really sort of the interesting. Eng- the English language. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I mean, that's kind of uh, you know that was my. Uh, I lived across the street from a really big attorney in South Florida. And when I was, I've thought about going to law school. My brother had kind of thought about it as well. He always said, you know, we were like, well, do you, did you major in, you know, pre-law or crime, all this stuff? He goes, no, I majored in speech, um, speech and drama because I wanted to be a litigator. He goes, I, he goes, I, I know I was going to learn everything I needed to learn where I was going to need to learn it. I needed the skills that were going to kind of offset that and help me. You needed the it. soft skills first. That's right. Um, and that, per- that person grew up to be Harvey Bergman, attorney <laughs> at law. This is very true. I wish I could name the name of who it actually is, but it's kind of cool. So, Ber- Harvey Bergman would be a Florida man, I think. I think he would be a Florida attorney, yes. Uh, yeah, 100%. totally. Um, so, so Nolan kind of flounders for a bit. He, he has success with three short films, but they're not like – they're they're reviewed well, but he's not getting anything. So he finally does a little movie called Following, which um, I don't think anybody watched until after Memento became a hit, and then people kind of well, went back. I, I, I remember getting the dual DVD, mm. uh, uh, the value DVD from yes. the- Memento and Following, right? Yes. From the Walmart, they they were boxed together. Yeah, I was which is to great, time. and I, I think that's awesome to get to you know and, and watch it. And Following was. Enough of a success to get him Memento. And Memento is really, obviously, I think where most people first became somewhat aware of. of I don't, maybe didn't even know Christopher Nolan at that point, but that movie was such no. a phenomenon when it came out. And I remember it was like, it also had several cast members from The Matrix in it. So I always was like, I was like, is this like a Matrix sequel? Like, what is this? And had, do you remember, do you remember like your high school movies or like your first DVDs because Memento was definitely one yeah. of my first DVDs. I remember the first CDs I got, you know, uh, fight club was in there. Uh, election was in there. Um, Memento. There were certain movies that kind of def- not only defined high school for me, but were also like your first purchase or among the DVDs that started your collection. Yeah. And Memento was absolutely that for me. Yeah, remember how like uh, maybe you don't remember this because I was one of the four people in America that has Sega CD system, but it came <laughs> it came with the game Sewer Shark. I feel I like oh my Sewer God, Shark. I feel like the Matrix was the Sewer Shark of like all <laughs> surround sound <laughs> DVD systems. Wow! Like, in, in 1999, like if you got a DVD and you didn't get the Matrix when it came out on DVD, it was like <laughs> that was like a cardinal sin. Wow! What a pull! Yeah. Sewer Shark. That is uh, Casey August will appreciate that reference because we used to play that terrible, terrible, terrible game. <laughs> that was the game was terrible. only like an hour and forty five minutes. It if was. You play it, it, was uh, it was that game Dragon Slayer, but just in a sewer with terrible graphics and worse gameplay. <laughs> Guys, can, can, can we pivot to make this a Sega CD podcast? <laughs> we, we cannot. We cannot. That'll Fuck. be next. Let's talk about Echo the next Dolphin time. for the next forty minutes. <laughs> no, I like no. Death Trap. Remember Death Trap? Oh lordy. Okay. Yeah, I oh. Death Trap. Man, that was good. <laughs> Poor Christopher Nolan, no respect from the, the new way ever. Um, and, it, and, it, and it also brought about the, the remixes of Dragon's Lair and right. Space Ace. Right. 
right. With the CD tractor technology. Hey, Ooh. did that guy you used to work for, did he get any money for those games that used the CD-ROM chapter I'd skip like Dragon's Lair? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I bet we'll, you he did. It's very possible. Um, so for, for me, I mean, Memento was one of those that I, I kept hearing about and then eventually got to, and I wasn't, I think it was a little beyond me maybe the first time I saw it and I, I kind of want to also think I was better than I was very in my pretentious mode so I was just like oh big deal it's told it's told out of order and this is not if you told this in normal order it's just a boring it's just a whatever story and then I really just had to like the more I watch it I had to just admit that it is a pretty fun mind fuck beyond me can be found in your grocer freezer next to the real meat I'll come back to this because I, I have a kind of an interesting thing on Memento is I went the opposite direction, Matt. When I first saw it, I was just like, this is fucking brilliant. And then somebody who I won't mention who the person is uh, out of respect, but um, but somebody who I don't didn't ever particularly care for their film opinion did say something really interesting to me. And they said, think about the movie linear linearly um, and all of the plot mechanics outside of the fact that the guy has, and, and I'm sure Matt can explain the plot a little bit, but outside of the mechanics of the guy having uh, amnesia or short-term amnesia, and the story kind of sucks. And I was like, oh shit, it actually kind of does suck. And see, but, I, I, yeah, but I, it the has mechanics killed, it, of the story is what the story is. But it's, if you, it, but if you, I'm sorry, Ben, but if you watch it literally, the, Joey Pants is still in the movie. So I don't know. <laughs> I, how you can attack it i think oh, this is true so i i like yeah, i think we did we absolutely flip flops i i that was my my first reaction was that but then the more i watch it you watch it, you realize yes that device is intrinsic into sort of the message of the movie and what what is your identity if you have no memory and you're always just constantly starting over do you ever build back to that original self or are you always just this new transformation of yourself well, it's oh, interesting. No, i definitely I only, my only other frame of reference is Pulp Fiction. That that that, that device was new to me at the time. That, that that's why I let Sean do it. It felt new. Maybe maybe it was, um, you know, pedestrian by today's standards. But when back Rashomon, then, like that was always the one that like I I also had a I had a a mother that liked to like shit on things. <laughs> so not literally. Uh, like figuratively, <laughs> she um, had a real problem. She had a real uh, defecation, real defecation, defecation everything, everything. But she would like she said the same thing for Pulp Fiction. She's like, they've done that. They, this is the Rashomon. This is that. This has been done. This no. This is nothing new. This is nothing amazing. He's doing the same thing that's been done before, and he's getting credit for it. And I'm like, yes, but it's also doing it well and doing it right and making it fit into. Well, what I, your I, message you're trying to get. I, I, but that's the reason why I kind of came back to the middle on it eventually. Because I, I, like I started out thinking it was one of the most brilliant things I'd ever seen. And then I kind of had this aha moment where I was just like, well, the story does kind of suck. And then I kind of realized, I was like, it's not really about the story. It's not, I mean, it's not. No. Like the 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 the, the whole thing, like you said, comes back to identity and also just the the, the linear model of time, but which is always something that, that no one likes to play with. Uh, or, or the concept or construct of time. And I was like, if you are just m focusing on like they want you to, like the filmmakers want you to, not so much the plot devices in the movie when it comes to the actual characters and what they're going through, but the fact that a person can't identify themselves within themselves uh, and they continue to lose themselves over the course of many times over the course of the narrative. That's the, that's the story. And, yeah. and, and so I think and, when, and you, I mean, you, you can't you ignore just, the cast is amazing. You got, you got rising, rising Guy Ritchie. Joey Pence is always going to, going to, going to turn on a good performance for me as someone who just flirting with the idea of getting into film. Um, that was exciting for me. And, yeah. and look, and look, maybe he got more credit than he deserved. Um, but that was my gateway into sort of, you know, higher thinking film. It really was because it hit me at just the right time. Well, it's and it's one of those things if you watch now, I mean, it's it's clearly a very well-made film, considering that they didn't have a huge budget. It's a very well-made film. It's very well-constructed. It's really well shot. Um, it, it's way prettier than it needs to be. And they also are smart in the way that they use the device of the of the coloring in order to kind of jump back and forth between time periods without completely discombobulating the viewer. It's so it's well constructed. I, I like, I think it's a good movie. Uh, there's yeah. no question. Well, and it's also, and it, 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 it's another thing that Nolan does extremely well, which is that 
it is it is heady material. It is a little confusing. And he doesn't – He and we'll get to the one that Ben and I do argue about on sort of Nolan telling instead of just showing or instead of kind of just jumping into things. But I think what Nolan does a pretty damn good job of is holding hands just enough to keep a wide audience – into it and 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 following it and wanting to learn more and keeping people that might be savvier or more discerning also entertained at the same time, which is a really sure. hard tightrope act to do. Before we jump ahead, I also want to kind of compare it a little bit to following because I think following is one of Chris Nolan's best films, mostly just because it's so insular and it really is about somebody who I feel and just so you kind of understand the, the or movie his is, path went astray the, 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 well the movie is about a, a person who essentially has this intrinsic need to basically follow people i mean it's like it, but i think the idea in it is that <laughs> it, and of course that it turns into a much wider plot as the movie gets along but that's how it's established and i i think the idea again is a guy who does not have his own identity who is essentially trying to steal they're trying to relate to other people's identity so he can absorb that. That's like his, his intrinsic need uh, as, as a being. And it carries a lot of similarities to Memento in that case, where you have somebody whose identity is literally erased every 15 minutes uh, or 20 minutes. And, uh, and he has to regain it, regains it basically his own personality and humanity over the course of a set amount of time. Um, so it's, it, it, it's a different thing, but again, it kind of plays into these bigger themes where it's like, I, I, it's always people searching for themselves. I think that's, that's his biggest thing is it's always somebody searching for themselves in his movies um, to greater or lesser effect, depending on the film. <laughs> or there's always maybe, someone lost in his, <laughs> in, 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 I mean, honestly, but, yeah. to, I think that that's the reason why Batman was attractive to him because Batman was, is always a character that's basically trying to find himself. He's working as a dichotomy of two, yeah. you know, uh, in, of two characters that are essentially working against one another, and uh, yeah, I think well, that that's what's and that's, uh, attractive to him. Yeah, and and uh, and, we'll, and I, I want to get to something I didn't know that he was. I vaguely had remembered this fact, but um, but I, he follows up Memento with a, a really a movie that I don't think a lot of people have seen in Nolan's so work, good. which is a phenomenally good movie, Insomnia. Um, an amazing, amazing. Best Robin Williams. Better Robin Williams is better than Insomnia than he was at Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, I will it say is it. an incredible. amazing performance, and and uh, I think it's maybe one of the few times that, uh, 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 good lord, uh, Pacino. It, maybe the last times he was somewhat lower lower key than he is in a lot of his stuff, even though he still finds finds ways to be bombastic in it. But um, it's a really good, and it's a remake as well. And it's one of the few remakes that even the guy is a Norwegian movie from 1997. I forget what the name of the original was, but even the director, <laughs> I believe it's called insomnia. Oh, it, it, I thought it had yeah, like a different it name. Um, it talks about how he's like, I, it's a really good movie. Star, star, starring Stellan stars, scars guard. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, the other of the the other Goodwill Hunting, not Peter Sarsgaard, Stellan yeah. Sarsgaard, yeah, who plays I, I know, was was the cop in the original uh, Insomnia. I've seen the original Insomnia, and oh, honestly, will say the original and the American version are pretty much tit for tat. There, there's I would not say one is better than the other, which is rare to say about a remake. And you know, I now that you guys have been talking about this and and opening this up a bit, uh, he definitely has motifs, right? Oh yeah, but but to me. Chris Nolan is defined by sort of the the, the Kubrick school of um, uneasiness. He he loved to create unease, um, and he did that a couple of ways. Uh, I know we we breezed through Memento, but uh, I was reading randomly, and this came up organically in my Reddit feed or something. That most hour and a half movies have six hundred to seven hundred cuts, but because he, um, oh, you know what? That's Requiem for a Dream. Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, you. I, oh my god! Yeah, we went through. We, I was like, I know we've talked about that exact thing, but well, in Requiem for a Dream, there are two thousand cuts to create a sense of uh, loss of control and uneasiness. But uh, <laughs> that's a different filmmaker. No, I in, Insomnia, and I don't really Oops. want to spoil too much from Insomnia. I think it's if you haven't watched it, especially now that you've got a kind of a summer possibly of of catching up on movies and things, and you like Nolan films, I think it's definitely worth the watch. Um, that was one. I, I mean, I, I saw that. Right, I think right as it came out on DVD, I, I believe I because I had just seen Memento and I was kind of into that, and I, and I went to, and I liked Insomnia much better than Memento. So it, I was does like, oh. feel, it, it it is more like you know uh, 
it's his ride along, right? He didn't he didn't write it. He just yeah. directed it. Well, he was tapped um, by uh, Soderbergh. Uh, okay, had, had got the script, and the studio did not want Nolan, and Soderbergh had to fight for him. He's like, I think he, this guy is going to like do something good with this, and then it became a really big critical hit. It wasn't a huge. Uh, financial success but a lot of the critics started to really notice nolan and it got his name out there and i don't know i don't know if now you know you watch that movie and you're like oh yeah it's, it, no one's got his fingerprints all over it he just he he worked with the strengths which it's takes place in alaska it's always light out which is a weird you talk about creating a sense of unease yeah you know i I've often imagine what that would be like and how weird and unsettling that would be, and he just uses that. It's just weird. Great, great effect where he's struggling in his hotel room. He's trying to focus on this investigation, but he's always got to have the, the the drapes closed and lights always creeping in, keeping him up. Um, just a really good eerie setting. Uh, and when you have a competent director like that to just really create that world, it doesn't matter that he didn't write it or have his hands in it in the honeypot the way he normally did. He just stepped up to the plate and really created a, a, a nice little thriller. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting to think about what he could do with somebody else's penned work, you know, in the future as well, whether yeah. he's going to always continue to churn out uh, his own stuff and go to something else. Now, what's really interesting, I, and I I had vaguely remember hearing this, but I did not remember it being Nolan spearheading it. So between Insomnia and Batman Begins, um, which kind of kicks off his next start, he writes a Howard Hughes biopic, which he, to date, says is the best screenplay he has ever written. He he taps Jim Carrey. He's going to cast Jim Carrey as Howard that. Hughes. And I remember I that's preferred him in The Grinch. I remembered Carrey I remember as Carrey, Hughes, yeah. but I did not remember it was Nolan. And Nolan stopped, uh, they stopped pursuing it once they found out that Scorsese was making a version. They said they weren't going to, he wasn't going to go do like competing biopics with it and he shelved it. And I'm like, that's got to suck to have like just this great screenplay you've written and just be like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit and compete with Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, which was a huge, I mean, that movie was a huge movie, but I would love to see a Nolan directed Hughes flick with, with 2002 Jim uh, Carrey, 2003 oh, I mean, Jim it was Carrey. 2004. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. Um, I wonder, I wonder what Scorsese, I mean, Scorsese, uh, famously railed against the marvel movies i would love to know what he thought of dark knight um because when you think about the things that he criticized with the marvel tent pole that was really something that chris no chris Nolan created a new batman world that was firmly cemented in animation and uh in tim burton's films that were very successful and and elevated it like you said matt that that, that when you think about it in retrospect, he was a perfect pick for that because you wanted the, the everything that was fun about Batman to persist, but you needed to adapt and not just to make it gritty, but to adapt it in a world that made sense and and to adapt it artfully. And well, he, I think he definitely did that. Yeah. And when he was, remember, he's following Aronofsky's like almost Batman movie that got year real one. far uh, year one, which was going to be the new Batman. And then that, that flamed out. Um, and so then you you know you have got a studio that's panicked um, at that point. Darren like, Aronofsky yeah. directed Requiem for a Dream. It's true, that um, had two thousand cuts in it, Matt. We, things come full circle. We uh, so we <laughs> so it, it is interesting, you know, that you got to think from a studio standpoint. They really could not have picked a better person to kind of launch off this franchise and do it, you know. And, the, and it was a big deal to him to do things, you know. I mean, it's Batman. It's not. It's not ground. I didn't answer your question, Nick. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't actually answer your question. I don't think Scorsese sees any difference in any. I, I think Scorsese's <laughs> reaction to every superhero movie is Nicholson in Joker being like, he's probably out there washing his tights. Like, I think that's <laughs> literally his view of all comic book movies is the old Batman TV series from the 70s, and that's all he's ever going to think about any Okay, of them. boomer. Um, it's just, it, I don't think it exists. But um, but yeah, so Batman Begins was, a. I remember that was such a big deal. The casting of Christian Bale was, I you know there were so many like fanboys were really excited because of American Psycho was such this like, underground hit even though he's coming off of uh, uh the movie where he lost like a ridiculous amount of weight and the studio was like he's not big enough to play <laughs> batman he had to like throw on a hundred pounds pretty much to to and like they, they talk about the scenes they shot he's like they, no one's like we had to shoot the bits with him training with um 
uh, in the in uh, where, where is he at? He's in a not Scandinavia. He's in um the uh what's it it's called? Like Uk- or, uh, no, it's like the Asian. The... Like it's yeah, it's like a Asian country, like Tibet or something. Like, wherever yeah, he's Nepal. like training Nepal, Nepal. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> was it there. Nepal? I think it's like did you, Nepal. Just, did you just say that, or is it actually where? No, I think it's I think, actually Nepal. I think I think it's Nepal. Um, and so he's like doing the where he's on like those posts and he's doing the push ups and like we we barely got him bulked up enough for this scene because like the when we did rehearsals for his it looked like like an emaciated like <laughs> guy that was just like and the shoes like we don't know what to do like we don't think this oh, is gonna work. Oh good <laughs> for him. Yeah. Um, and and th- th- fast forward to today Robert Pattinson is saying he's not even working out in quarantine for Batman. He's yeah. like fuck it. I don't want to set a precedent. Christian Bale's a psychopath. It's true. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean what was your what was your opinion of Batman Begins when you when you first saw it? Was you, were you, I mean I know there's it's not a Loved perfect it movie immediately. but immediately immediately it was like okay um, and it's 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 funny looking back on this now. We we've had what one good DC movie since Nolan left the the Batman verse, and you look back and and think that actually he was under some immense pressure. Tim Burton kind of defied expectation by creating a really visceral, very different world than than where Nolan went, but was loved and and revered. Um, we see a Batman and, and more importantly, a Bruce Wayne that we did not see with, with Michael Keaton. And it, it's the reason why I, I'll say Daniel Craig is my favorite Bond. Maybe it's just because that's who I grew up with. Uh, but I will also say that I, I think absolutely Christian Bale is the best Daniel Bruce Craig's Wayne, first Batman. Bond movie came out when you were 23. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like, wait a minute, Casino, you grew up with him. Casino I grew up with Royale. Roger Moore. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't grow up with Bond. You know, that's so you what didn't I grow up with Bond, so that was a bad analogy. <laughs> I would say, I would say whatever you grow up with is your first true introduction and whenever something truly latches on. And so that's it, what that was. So if you never saw a Scorsese film until you're 71, that's what you grew up with. <laughs> well, Scorsese I mean, film that I grew up with. It's it was this, definitely the Irishman. It's this. Oh God! What a terrible Here's, world! Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> the thing is, it's, it's like Star Wars. You know, like, like there are people out there, and the, the prequels are are their Star this Wars. And now there are kids where you know, Rise of Skywalker is their Star Wars. It's, I, it's, I, it's I, terrific. I, I understand. Yeah, I was just, I was just joshing. I know. Why don't you stop? Why don't you stop pulling my chain there buddy what did you what did you think ben of uh, batman begins what was your kind of reaction to that I, I i really liked uh i well i would say this i really liked uh when i first saw it the first two acts and then the last act i was just like this is a little you know it's a little weird like it's a little preposterous you know, that's the thing. Which is, would be it's Ben's like, reaction to the next like seven Nolan movies. Well, so so the, 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 it's oh kind of interesting just because <laughs> that Batman film was very unrealistic. Well, no, no. Well, the, the idea the, that's the idea is everyone's just like it's so gritty and realistic. I'm like, is it though? until the end? <laughs> like the first two acts, kind of, and then the third act, they're just like, nope, we're gonna abandon all that, and actually, it's just this big old bad guy, and it's this you know plot to rule the world or. And then, the, and, and then poison they have- everyone in Gotham City. And I was just like, all the acting is fantastic, and none of that changes. That's and- a comic book plot, though. But then, but then true. also the third act set pieces kind of suck. Uh, it, it like the, the middle of the movie is the strength of that I, movie. I, I it think- didn't stick the landing for you. No, and no. I, I think I think the the monorail bit doesn't work for me. But I love work. I love the bit where you see. Is there a chance the track could bend? I love I love the I love the scene where you where you're on the island and the fear gas is out and there's all the chaos going on with like the released prisoners and all the shit on that like that and that's the one thing I thought sure. Nolan did a great job and he makes he made Batman scary like he really made him this thing to be feared. You always hear about. Batman talking about how th- th- he runs fear into criminals and he does all these things and you're like well, yeah but it's a guy in like a Batman I mean, suit and you're like oh no I mean, shit this th- guy's scary I still love the the middle the middle act of that like when when uh, Crane gets gases himself basically accidentally and he's basically a melting Batman and he's just like I'm sorry <laughs> Doctor Crane isn't in right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that I thought that- and, and and the train and the training uh, I mean something yeah. you never saw we just we just and any version of Batman we just kind of hit the ground running and he's he's Batman right away. Right. 
you know, and Batman I, I, Begins is all about showing just how disciplined and just how much of a sociopath he is. I have a slight critique uh, of of the beginning of the movie, which I'll come back to because it has to do with all three of the movies. Uh, uh, but right. but but ultimately, I I think that Batman you're, Begins. You're gonna you're good, gonna you're gonna memento your. Comments. I think Batman Begins is a good movie that people kind of forget about the last act and the figure about the fact that it's grounded in reality and then all of a sudden it becomes kind of preposterous preposterous now i don't completely blame that on nolan either because i still think it's handled probably as deftly as it could have been i blame a lot of that on goyer because i think that goyer is a super inconsistent writer and it has proven that he's got some problems sticking the landing with a lot of the stuff that he's written so yeah, and I mean, I think we can talk about the Batman trilogy and, and, and go on because I also like what Nolan does during the Batman period where he's doing one one studio movie, Batman, and then kind of something that he wants to do in between. And he ends up doing a couple of really good movies in between. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Batman Begins shows this great promise of what you can do with it. I love that it bleeds into uh, The Dark Knight. With the same thing about that fear, like I like that the Joker comes into that group and he's like, I know why you hold all your meetings during the day. Like, I know what I know, like, you, like everyone is everyone's scared of this fucking guy that is running around the city terrorizing criminals. It's working. You know, he's actually doing it until he meets, you know, then you get the Joker who's going to now elevate that whole unmask, thing. Unma he unmask Batman without oh. literally doing it. He take taking away the mystique. And, you know, a, a thing that's really fun to watch now, what we're all dealing with now with a lot of, you know, fear and misinformation and we don't know when we'll be able to leave our apartments. The Joker, I mean, Chris Nolan's Joker, and I think he share, you know, share credit with, with Heath, maybe give Heath 75% of the credit. Yeah. 25% goes to Nolan. Nolan's Joker would have a field day with our current society. His whole thing was about, you know, with a little, with, with a little bit of fear and, and, and chaos, they're, Controlled. They want to be controlled. They want to. Be, it's a really interesting take on society, and and it was it was Batman versus Joker, but they were symbolic of sort of I, I think maybe Law and Order in in, in Batman, of course, and and just well, it's, pure chaos. It's being it's believing in the best in people and believing in the worst in people, and that's the yeah. that's the the Joker believes that the the worst will always rise. That is what will and, happen. It just takes one bad day. That's always been the Joker's big thing. And, and, while, and while Batman wins, you kind of end that movie on the Joker's side, more or less. I think. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I don't agree I, with I, that. I, 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 think, I, think, I think you don't have to agree with his methods, but it, it's what made him great was not – he wasn't physically um, – he wasn't like a, like a Batman physically intimidating – he was just cold and and more calculating than you even expected. He knew people. He knew, and they definitely took that into the walk. They took that part of of Heath Ledger's Joker and infused it into Joaquin Phoenix's. But but I mean, ultimately, I think one of the the kind of things that the movie, the message of the movie, is that at the end he didn't get people because he expected something to happen at the end and it ended in his own incarceration and because it didn't happen the way that he anticipated it happening. Well, not only that, he doesn't also, he also doesn't anticipate Batman taking the higher, the, the harder path to be right. like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to let you ruin Harvey Dent. I'm going to, I'm going to fix that at my own expense. I'm going to sacrifice myself to do mm -hmm. this. So I mean, that's that great line. And, and Ben, I, I agree with you. The third act of that movie is a mess with, with, with what happens it's with Two Face. The only problem is that that what it results in is fucking great. Like I think the end that what happens at the tail end of that with the problem is that you, it happens too quick and the Harvey Dent thing happens too fast. But that uh, but that has to happen to get you to that moment at the end, and it really is a great moment at the end. Assuming that everybody has seen the Dark Knight, yes. who is listening to this podcast. Um, I, I will say what I've always said multiple times is that I will say that the Dark Knight is a brilliant movie for its first three acts. Most films are three acts. It's a three act structure. You essentially have your setup, your premise going into, you know, the, the, your, your, your central plot point, uh, you know, leading essentially to, you know, this pinnacle, uh, you have a middle act of the movie and then you have your resolution towards the end. 
uh, your after, after your cli- after your climax, <laughs> your denouement, Ben. After your climax, it's the, the the problem with acknowledge his joke, Ben. The pro- I, I got I got it. I got it. All right, good. Go ahead. The, pro- the problem with the Dark Knight is it's a four act movie. It gets to that past that climax, and then well, the movie yeah. runs for twenty five minutes. You know longer. why? And, and 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 again, I agree with that one hundred percent. And that's my only real criticism of the film. Yeah, but here's too. but here's what I think happened, and here's it's where short I, change. It short change is one of the greatest villains well in the over that, that's just it ben. of kane's batman ben that, that that's just it though the story i mean from a comic book perspective the story is not about the joker it's setting up harvey dent the story is about harvey dent and i think that when they wrote that that was that was the plan that was supposed to be the the last thing you saw the resolution of his story um that was supposed to be what you end the movie on what they what? didn't wait well, hold on what they okay. didn't anticipate what they could not possibly have counted on was just a the last tour de force performance by ledger oscar winning performance of a villain that we might never see and if you want to talk about who did it who, who was the better oscar winner winning joker to me it's heath ledger and it's not even close what they didn't anticipate is when they got into the editing room, they watched the dailies and they're like, oh shit, this is lightning in a bottle. But it derails our story about Harvey Dent. We got to pay up. We got to finish the story. But what they should have done is at a certain point, you have to realize it became the Joker's movie organically. And maybe that's not what they planned for, but it's what ended up happening. And it should have just ended with him suspended by his feet. Well, I, I, I agree with that last point. Here's the thing. The Joker is by far, far and away, far and away, the most popular Batman villain of all time. That It's the one that everybody knows. So I, I think that they had to know if you're going to make a movie with the Joker in it, well, it's going to be the and, Joker's and just movie. The plot, and, no, right, I mean, but, but, but Nolan but, elevates stuff. Oh, yeah. Nolan elevates it, and there was more nuance and I, symbolism with, with Two Face. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there were. I don't think there was a surprise to them. They shot a script that has a has a climax with the boat bit, and then the and then the Joker hanging by his feet. Like that is a climax of the movie. That dent thing. You can't have both of those scenes in the movie the way to make it flow how it needs to flow. It, it it's too much. I think that. Either I don't know. It, it, I don't know what. Short change is a great villain to yeah. basically seventeen minutes of screen time. And, and what they should have done is they should have done exactly what you said, Nick. They should have ended the movie with the Joker being caught, being put in Arkham Asylum, and the bat and the la- the Dark Knight Rises should have been about fucking Two Face. Yes, yeah, That's what it should have been. It yeah. shouldn't have had Bane. Bane should have never even entered the fucking picture. Agreed. In, and that's the re- one of the reasons why I will say that The Dark Knight Rises is not a great movie. It, it's it's I would say it's his week. It's definitely Nolan's weakest movie, and his and it's all of his uh, well, movies. Well, so if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're a Ravens fan, at least you got to see Heinz Field blow up. The, it is true. Yeah, um, and I think yeah. I mean, we the the Dark Knight Rises is is I I don't have actually major problems with Dark Knight Rises. It's just a little bit of so a letdown. You came back to die with the city. It's no, a le- it's a letdown. I but I want to I want to make sure we get because we're running real we're running real close to I time. And we're we're darkness. only like halfway through this, so I definitely want to get to. I want to get yeah. out, outside the Batman stuff here for a little bit. So uh, real quick, real quick. No, no, no. no, no Hathaway, the, Anne Hathaway, best part of that movie. Okay. <laughs> so um, so we've got these three Batman movies. And in between um, the first two, uh, there's a little movie called The Prestige. If you listen to the podcast, we have talked about The Prestige a few times on air. We even got kind of a review, review from Nick. I did it in one of our recasting episodes. Um, so I don't want to go too much in The Prestige other than to say that it I, for me, it is maybe my... I don't know if I can call it my favorite Nolan, but it's real close. I re- I just everything about that movie works for me. Ben, I know, has some issues with the last act, which, by the way, Ben, remind me after this podcast. I read what the actual plot of the book is, and it is way worse. <laughs> you would have been even more upset, I think, with the ending and what happens in the book. But um, after the, that, if you haven't watched The Prestige, it's a movie about warring magicians yes. uh, that that are basically going tit for tat with one another, one epic, and it goes and they destroys they destroy each other's lives essentially. And I don't like the movie because it takes a hard turn from one genre into the other in the last act. Yeah, but in the, uh, in in the movie the- again, that's grounded in realism. That falls apart in the last act. Are we are we sensing a little bit of a trend okay, here? All right. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just, so, I'm just, just saying in, in, in the book, Hugh Jackman wakes up at the end and it was all a dream. That's right, exactly. Right. So in between Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises is one of no. Well, that was Inception. Big, 
biggest movies is Inception. Yeah, and Inception is. Um, Bong. I, I remember being really. Um, I remember being really scared from the previews of Inception because Ben and I were writing a TV pilot at that point about dreams, and every time I would see a commercial, I was just like, "Fuck, fuck, fuck, fuck!" They're they they're doing the thing that we're going to try to do in this movie, which they didn't really. Um, Inception is no. great when you view it as fact. As Inception is about the filmmaking process, um, it's something they've kind of established very much. It is a metaphor for it. Each of the characters represents someone in the making of a movie. With Cobb being Leonardo DiCaprio being the director, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt being the producer, uh, uh, Bane. Uh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, being the Hardy. actor, Tom Hardy. Oh, Tom Hardy. Um, so you've got all of these different things that are in play. <laughs> Ellen Page is the script. Ellen supervisor. Page is the is the is the writer, is the screenwriter. But Inception is um, about a a future where you can tap into people's dreams, and you can. Uh, some people are, are so rich and so famous and so big that they get security for their dreams, so that people can't go in there and try and give them ideas and manipulate things. It's the, the basic premise of the movie, and it's a heist film. Um, by by the time you get through the end of it, now I know Ben has a big problem with the first hour of the movie or most of the Ellen the introducing Ellen Page to the world of how the how the inception works uh, uh, well it, it comes down to the rule of of show don't tell uh an exposition and the rules of exposition and Nolan has always been pretty bad about kind of having his movies talk a little bit too much about what's happening as opposed to showing what's happening and that goes back to the Batman films too I, uh, one of the things I said when I said I have a little bit of a problem with the beginning of Batman Begins, there's a little too much talking and not enough showing uh, when it's trying to establish everything. A little less conversation, baby. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Inception is a real bad offender. And I understand it's so high concept, but it's talking down to an audience. It's basically talking down to the lowest common denominator of audience to make sure that the dumbest Joe is going to understand what's going on. And if you had left it more ambiguous, it would have been a way better movie anyways. Which, um, I mean, and, I, and I'll and i argue that there are people that on. already felt it was confusing. And, and this, this yeah. is what I think. Like, had people to. thought yeah. the Lord of the Rings was fucking confusing. I, well, not not everyone has the intellectual capacity of one <laughs> Benjamin Scott Wilson. I, so that I, I think that I There's think. There's an hour of talking straight. It's just an hour of talking. That's what yeah. you do. <laughs> That's what this episode Touché. is. Apparently, <laughs> mostly. Probably going to be more than that. But um, no, I, I think Inception is knows it's a heady film. It knows it's also coming out in July. And this is not some art house movie that's going to get come out in November for Oscar thing. Got like no one knows million dollar budget. He knows his fucking audience. And I and also if it wasn't so visually impressive and I wasn't dealing with actors like Ellen Page and Leonardo DiCaprio, who, yeah, I'll sit and watch them talk for an hour, then it might be more problematic for me. But I enjoy I don't feel that that is tedious time spent on that, even if that was like released thing, as a short before it or something. Well, think of the other ways okay. that it was influential, though. Also, like m movie scores and sound design are still mimicking oh, what 100%. they did there, and that was groundbreaking. I uh, know, I, I completely agree with all of that, and, and I, I will say, um, Inception is just exceptional looking. I mean, it's such a great looking movie. I mean, god damn, is that a good looking movie? And some of the way that they did the set design and some of the ways they built the set pieces is fucking brilliant. I mean, it's like, like, there's a no Bond question. Movie. Like, it's, it's I mean, great. It, it was his Bond movie. That's yeah. what he said. He said he made Inception because he wanted to make a Bond movie. I mean, and then, he, and then he passed movie. the ball to Doctor Strange. Um, right. But, but no, I, I think it's just interesting. Like I said, it, it it's, I feel like it's not, it's a light criticism of me just saying there's too much exposition at the beginning of the movie because, and, and again, this all comes back to my thing that I'm going to say at the very end of the podcast where it's just like, I'm not annoyed by, <laughs> oh, by I'm not annoyed by Chris Nolan. It, like you guys think I am. I'm not annoyed. I think Chris Nolan is one of the better filmmakers that's around out there. And but I fucking hate him. No, I still I like him. I like I like Chris Nolan. I legitimately like Chris Nolan. I do like I, I love him. I like that they carried um I don't like Dark Knight Rises. I don't like Interstellar, but I 
speaking of Interstellar, uh, yeah, which followed The yeah. Dark Knight Rises. So Inter- I hate Interstellar. I hate it. So, so coming from a movie with great sound design, um, we, come, <laughs> we come to a movie that purposely fucks with the sound design just, just to fuck with you, so which dumb. is unnerving. And I also happened to watch that movie with my brother in the South, the South Florida Science Museum True IMAX, the one where it's like... I, so basically, I'm staring at Matthew McConaughey's nostrils for a, a good two thirds of that movie is just a shaky camera looking right up his nostrils and really bad sound coming through. Um, that said, as with any Nolan movie, there's good shit in it. There's interesting shit in it. There's fun stuff in it. As a whole, not though, the library <laughs> scene. As a whole, it the is the library a, scene was like was it, to me it was the same feeling that was invoked when Batman and Superman realize that their mother is named Martha. It was the same. Like, are you fucking kidding me? That's I mean, how we're gonna. It was end also this. kind of like just. I mean, so much of that was telegraphed, though, know, as far as all sure. of the stuff that's happening in the beginning of that movie. Um, there are, and he's dealing with a lot of his tropes in it. And there's, there are effective beats in that. I think when he gets back up after they get, they have the the issue in the water planet and he finds out that they've skipped like 20 years in the, the time that's passed on earth and that like realization. And it's, it's a shame because I think that cast and that director, there is a really good fucking movie in there. And there's some amazing performances and work and Jessica Chastain, um, in it, I think there's a lot good in there. It's just, it, it, collapses in the black hole that it is unfortunately that's how i feel about contact and that movie interstellar reminded me of contact oh, contact is such a, a, a supremely better film though i think yeah. I, I i i also i also agree but i i I've, and it has one of the best shots in cinema but i also re- remember feeling like man they had everything going for it i didn't love it as much as i should have and I actually left like kind of annoyed i remember that was the uh that was the south the south park uh that came out like right after that and it's mr garrison just has like a throwaway line because they're, like someone's like keeps talking about contact he's like wait the hell goddamn movie find out the aliens just her dad <laughs> like, so upset about about the plot of it but i'm like i thought it was great um uh, yeah i mean interstellar it, it's a huge it takes a huge swing i uh, there's sars uh, is great the robots some of the effects and stuff but yeah it's that uh, good and then he he follows that up with a a somewhat quieter movie for him with Dunkirk, literally quieter, and that there's almost no dialogue in the movie. Um, I would say one of his better movies from a, it is. from a thematic standpoint and from a pacing standpoint. I loved it. I thought it was so fluid. You just don't like it when a Christopher Nolan character talks. That's not true. <laughs> no, I I think I mean Dunkirk. I like Memento. I like Insomnia. Well, and Dunkirk's also another one that. Nolan plays with time like he can't it's like um, you have directors that fall into tropes and things that they can't even help themselves from at at times and I think that happens I know we talked about it Ben with Dunkirk and that it's another one of these that's told in different non-linearly and it doesn't really do anything other than it's just there it's just a device that sort of exists that doesn't have a reason to exist other than it's like hey it's kind of cool that we're doing this this thing it doesn't affect the movie I I don't think it makes the movie bad but I don't think it elevates or, or does anything for the movie. Um, and of course, his next his next movie, Tenet, looks like it's about like time traveling crime people. It looks like it's like a time cop deal. So of course he's he's going back to that. But I, I think it's kind of interesting that that is his that seems to be his wheelhouse, his identity and time and how those things play with who you are and how they define you. Um, which I think is kind of cool to have that running through so much of your work which is going to be similar to an, another podcast we're going to get to shortly uh, with Damon Lindelof, I think, uh, as another person who carries themes over and over through their works that they're almost like they're, it's their therapy to get these things out. So, so I, 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 let me say the one thing I really wanted to say, which is about Chris Nolan. And, and again, I like Chris Nolan. I think that I, I, aside from my gripes about overexposition or about, you know, I, I think that in, in other times, a lot of his editing is poorly done. So he mm. didn't really know how to shoot fight sequences for a while. And he got better at it. You know, um, th- th- there's all sorts of minor gripes, but great storyteller, obviously high concept writer. The guy's an intellectual. He knows what he's doing for the most part. Short form podcast. That said, uh, every Joe 
like I said, because they talk down to stupid people, a lot of his movies kind of talk down to the dumb people, think that Chris <laughs> Nolan is basically greater than Kurosawa, greater than Hitchcock. He is the greatest director that has ever lived. And people that think that need to get fucked because Chris Nolan is a great director, yes. But there are so many better directors out there. And they're, historically, if you're going to compare him to Kubrick, fuck off. Fuck off. Get fucked. Just you get like, fucked. You like Bernie Sanders. You just hate the Bernie bros. <laughs> I like there you that, go. I like that we're ending. I like that you save for the end and literally just be like, fuck <laughs> Chris Jesus. Nolan fans. Right. Fuck you right in the ear. This has been our podcast. Thank you so much for taking a Seriously, 45 like, minutes with I us mean, to talk it, about. It, like if, if you're, it, it, they're so obnoxious. Ben, they're so ben, loud ben. and obnoxious. Well, well, ben, what, ben. What, what would you say if someone said the Get Up Kids were the worst emo band ever? Uh, that's They're entitled the to their same, opinion. Well, the, the, are Christopher Nolan fans not entitled to like that was their guy? That's they, they that's, have no, but they have no context. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like if you're going to talk about film that way, and you're going to talk about the best director ever, watch something for comparative measure. That 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 Chris Nolan movie they watch is the art house movie they watched that year. The only yeah. other things they're watching are fucking Transformers films. Yeah, and, the, well, what's, and so what, what's wrong with that? that what's wrong that, with and that? that? I think, but that's see, I agree. I think it's fine. Look, at least gumps. At least someone's Jesus. trying, but at least they're getting some elevate. That's what I like about getting, Nolan. It's a gateway. Sure. I like it's that accessible. he's got it. It's and accessible. some of those people are going to take what they see with Nolan and they're going to watch other films that they might not Good necessarily on him. give a shot. Good on him, bad on them. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I think Coruscant and Hitchcock are fucking assholes. <laughs> totally. I've never heard of them, so I am not familiar. But uh, you're a dumb person. I do. I do like that the what. So the the last thing I'll, I'll let on here is uh, the final season of of Brockmire just aired, and there's been a running gag every season of how much Brockmire hates Christopher Nolan and the films of Christopher Nolan. Really? And I, and I send clips to Ben. Every oh time God. there's a bit in in it, and this last season he starts off with this compliment talking about um the it's basically it's a line about the the Joker delivers in the Dark Knight, and everyone's like, isn't that a Chris Nolan movie? He's like, he's like, yeah, it's the perfect line. What other kind of twisted? disgusting mind could come up with a ridiculous line and character like that. Like just hates, hates Chris Nolan movies to no end. It's a really, it's obviously somebody in the writer's room, like laid it out there in season two, just as a throwaway gag. And they liked it so much that it just like, it pops up. But unlike nice. Brock Meyer and to a lesser extent, Ben Wilson, I do not hate Christopher Nolan. Um, I think he's a really fun filmmaker. <laughs> um, you might want to look at like Denis Villeneuve's films. If you like Chris Nolan films, you want to kind of, Go take a next step into something because I and think you, he does. And you want to watch somebody who makes better films? Well, but if, I'm if, if but, you don't want to catch any fucking vitriol from Ben Wilson, no. But check I, out I these think, other highbrow films. I think I think Villano is really interesting because he's in a similar category Very of delivering similar. Similar. blockbuster movies that that operate on another level. And I think that there's there's art in both of them. So yeah, go ahead and, and educate a little bit more. But also, a great you, you're not going to take actually. you're not going to take Inception away from me um, or any uh, some of the other but, Nolan films or the prestige and stuff so yeah it's uh it is what it is but um i want to thank you so much for listening to the new way podcast uh You're welcome we are we are definitely coming at you all summer we have blocked enough episodes to get us through the end of august uh as of right now with uh no break in things plus we also have some live reading things that are gonna be coming out in the midst of these podcasts as well so stay tuned look for those on our youtube channel uh, thanks for listening again, and we'll talk to you next time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm not going to nice press the, the button until I news. hear the cheers from you, Nick. Oh, I just didn't oh. do it. I, I didn't it. hear you. Say cheers. Nick. Cheers. <laughs>